Shawarai surplus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you for your grace and thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy and compassion. Thank you because you brought us together so you can show us the way to life eternal. I need to disclose there's another way that you don't want us to take so we're not destroyed, doomed, and damned. Therefore, Lord, we pray you open our ears to understand today and give us a heart to follow through your word in Jesus' name. And we're praying, oh Lord, that your spirit will quicken us, will awaken us, so that to point the right direction to every one of us, and we take that right direction in Jesus' name. Be glorified, O Lord, as we study your word today. And bring people into the kingdom that will prepare their hearts. Open the way for everyone, Lord, that we may see. And your spirit will lead us to move in and enter in through that gate, a narrow gate that leads to life eternal in Jesus' name. For those who are sinning and those who are in the broad way, Lord, we pray that your spirit in your love will call them back out of that broad way of destruction and perdition in Jesus' name. For those who have been in the narrow way before, but now they have gone over unto the broad way that leads to destruction and damnation, we pray, Lord, your spirit in faithfulness will call them back out of the evil of their ways in Jesus' name. Bless your people tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We're looking at Matthew tonight. We're reading Matthew chapter 7. We're taking two verses of scripture together, but we're actually concentrating on the first verse, verse 13. Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading to you from verse 13 and verse 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. As you're being with us in the study of the Sermon on the Mount, you'll find that the focus of the Lord Jesus Christ is the destiny of man. The Lord is not just looking at us today. Neither is he looking at us just this week. He's not looking at us just for the present life we live. He's looking at what will be the end of the journey in which we are. The end of the life that we're living. From the very beginning, you'll find that the Lord has concentrated his attention, his mind, his teaching, his message on the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Because that is a real issue. That's a real important thing. You're going to find that it's all eternity. That he is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is for the whole of eternity. The time you spend here on earth is so very small. 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, even 100 years will be very, very small in comparison with eternity. And that's why you'll find the Lord did not concentrate on the matters of the moment, the matters of today, the matters of this week, the matters of this year, the matters of this life alone. He only talks about this life in relation to the life to come. He talks about where you are today, what you do today in relation to the things, to the consequence, the impact of what you do today on your eternity. And so he concentrates on the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God. Look at Matthew chapter 5. And that's where he began. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. Blessed is the, are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the opening of the message. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
That means then the important issue, the important thing, the indispensable thing, the focus is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, you'll find it didn't go very fine. Many of the verses, it comes back to that same issue. That same important thing. That same essential thing. Indispensable thing. What you need to think about. What we all need to think about. The kingdom of heaven. And there is showing, uh, you're not going to find it too easy. You're not going to get to the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven on a bed of roses. It's not going to be all that easy. The devil will not want you to get there. The flesh will wage war against your soul. The world will fight every inch of the way, all the way through. There will be persecution from those who are not the sons and the daughters and the children of the promise. Those who do not belong to the Lord. Those who are not going to heaven. They'll be wondering, how is it you make it the most important issue in your life? To want to get to the kingdom of God. Because of that, they'll persecute you. They'll oppress you. They'll put a lot of pressure upon your life. But Jesus said, hey, don't you bulge because of that. Blessed at they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven now he begins to tell us in verse 20 that getting to the kingdom of heaven is not cheap it requires something the righteousness of faith the righteousness of god and if you're going to get to the kingdom here is where it's at art. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 25, I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the point I'm showing to you is the concentration of Christ. The focus of Christ. And when you want you to center your affection, your mind, your goal. And when you want you to fix your gaze, your eyes, what you look at should be the kingdom of heaven. And he says, if you're going to get there, here is what it takes. The righteousness that we get from Christ at Calvary. We don't have the kind of natural righteousness that will get us to the kingdom of God. You turn away from your sin. And then you confess and forsake every evil sin that you have done that you are doing. And then you allow the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood that washes whiter than snow, to cleanse you, to purge you, to purify you, and then to prepare you for that life eternal. That's why it says it's going to take more than self-righteousness. It's going to take the righteousness of bare, mere, formal, superficial religion of the scribes and the Pharisees. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. It shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, leaving that chapter, he goes to chapter 6 and we're still talking on the concentration, the focus on the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 6, looking at verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Oh, you see, that's what I'm seeking. It says, but you have to add righteousness to that because you cannot go to the kingdom of God empty-handed, empty-hearted. There must be that righteousness that he purchased for us on the cross of Calvary. And it is that righteousness in your heart, in your life, that makes you to inherit that kingdom. Seek it first. 
Make it a priority. Make it number one in your life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he says, all these things shall be added unto you. Now chapter 7, reading from verse 21. Chapter 7 of Matthew. Verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth, he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. It says if you are going to spend eternity with the Father in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, you must be interested what's the word of the Father, the might of the Father, the will of the Father. And it's not just to say, Lord, Lord. What does that mean? Just to say, Lord, Lord. Well, number one, to know his name. You go beyond that. Number two, to come to a church where his name is mentioned, where his name is exalted. You go beyond that. Number three, to even begin to read the words of the Lord. That you're able to say, the Lord said, the Lord said. You go beyond that. That you're even able to do some religious activities to be able to say, have we not prophesied in your name and done many wonderful works in your name? In your name we have cast out devils. It says to go beyond that. That you must do the will of the Father who is in heaven. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter, shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth constantly, consistently, faithfully, loyally, submissively, he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Therefore, you understand what Jesus Christ centralized, focused on. The Lord looks at our lives as a journey. A journey from life unto eternity. He reveals two gates. And it says it's those through gates, those two gates that afford us a chance to enter into the way. And then it reveals two ways. Number one, the broad way. Number two, the narrow way. And then it reveals to us at the end of the way is the destiny, the destination. You start from the gate. You go through the way and then you end up in the final destination. Two gates, the wide and the narrow one. Two ways, the broad and the narrow one. Two destinies, life, life eternal. And then you have destruction, perdition. It tells us that those who enter through the wide gate will walk in the wide way, broad way, and then will end up in destruction. That means in torment, sorrow, and suffering in hell. But those who enter through the small gate, the straight gate, they then go through the narrow way. And the narrow way, it be consistently, constantly, and faithfully walk in that narrow way until the very end. Then they are going to end up in life, eternal life. That means fellowship eternally with the Almighty God. God has ordained only two distinct places to be, to be the final eternal abodes of men after this life. And between them, he has fixed a great gulf so that none can pass from the one to the other. We're looking at Luke chapter 16 verse 26. Luke chapter 16. And we're reading from verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, here is Abraham, life, eternal life, talking to that rich man in destruction, the final destiny of those who do not know God. And he's saying unto that rich man, beside all this, between us and you, there is a great goal fixed, so that they which will pass from hence to you cannot. 
neither can they pass to us that will come from this. Then it's very, very clear from the revelation of scripture that there are only two gates. The white gate for the multitudes, for the majority of the human race. And then the narrow gate for the few who make the right choice which God has ordained. And there are only two ways coming out of those two gates. The first gate, popular, broad, spacious, a broad-minded multitudes traveling there. And then the narrow way, the second one, the unpopular road traversed or traveled by few who walk and follow the Lord closely and consistently. There are only two destinations, not three. Only two, not three. Either heaven or hell. Either life or destruction. Either a place of bliss and a place of peace, happiness and joy, or a place of sorrow, torment, and suffering. There are some religious people, by the way, that have invented a third destination, which they call purgatory. It's an imaginary place of human invention. It does not exist. There is no purgatory. It's the imagination of religious people who want to pretend that they know more than Jesus Christ. Men enter through the wide gate or the narrow gate. There's no other, there's no third gate. Men travel through the broad way or the narrow way. There is no third way. And there are only two classes of people, the believers or the unbelievers, the saints or the sinners, the few or the many. There are either, we're either in the light or we're in darkness. We're either in the truth or we're in error. We're either among the few or among the multitude, either righteous or unrighteous. There is no third category of people. There are only two ends, the end of the broad way or the end of the narrow way. There are only two destinations for travelers journey through life. Life eternal or destruction unending. There are only two destinies, heaven or hell. The question to you today is, where will you spend eternity? As we look at the study tonight, we're going to divide to three parts. Number one, the broadened entrance gate for many into degeneration. The broadened entrance gate for many into degeneration. Number two, the broad evil way of multitudes leading to destruction. The broad evil way of multitudes leading to destruction. Number three, the bitter, eternal wages of many doomed to damnation. The bitter, eternal wages of many doomed to damnation. We come to number one, the broadened entrance gate for many into degeneration we're looking at matthew chapter 7 and i'm reading from verse 13 matthew chapter 7 verse 13 enter ye in at the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in they are at. Here the Lord is telling us how people enter into this gate and a life they live will show what gate they have entered through. It says, wide is the gate. I'm sure you understand about gates. 
If you're going to enter into some large, great, big cities, you have the gate that leads into the city. And sometimes in your communities, if you're going to enter into the community, sometimes uh, at night, then you find there's a large gate, and the gate is closed at a particular hour. That's what the Lord is referring to. And the Lord is making use of this example, this illustration. Because the Lord uses the visible, the tangible, the natural, the physical to illustrate the invisible, the intangible, what you cannot touch and see, the spiritual, the eternal. It says, don't you see in life? There is a wide gate, and that takes in very many people. But then there is the narrow gate that takes in just you, without your chariot, without your wagon. The Lord was actually illustrating that just as it is here, that there are gates that will take in the trucks and the lorries and the loads and the chariots and the great things that you have and take you and them together. The wide gate. But then it says the narrow gate will just take you without your car, without your load, without your chariot. Without the encumbrances that you may have. And it's a spiritual thing. The Lord is uh, teaching us through that. He's saying all you enter through the wide gate. Will travel on the broad way. And the only place this broad way leads to will be destruction, doom, and damnation. It's talking about the children of men. It's talking about people like you and me. People all over the world. And he's talking about the kind of life they live and the kind of choice they have made or the kind of choice they have not made. And let's look at humanity now at large. Humanity from the time of the beginning. Humanity from the time of Genesis. I'm reading Genesis chapter 1. Sorry, chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. We're reading there from verse 1. Then you'll see what the Lord says about the multitude. About the majority of people in life. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply. On the face of the earth. And daughters were born unto them. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men. That they were feared. And they took them wives of all that they chose. It's telling us how it all began. How the multitudes will not seek God. Will not find out the mind of God. The will of God. The directive, the guidance of God. And whatever they felt in their body. They just gave vent to. Whatever desires they had. They just gave the liberty to. And it said they felt the need that they ought to have women in their lives. Nothing wrong with that. Marriage is God's institution. The thing that was wrong is they didn't find out the word of God, the mind of God, the will of God. That wasn't important to them. All that was important to them was what they wanted, what they chose. How they felt. What will please them. What will please their flesh. And they chose up for themselves. Wives. Of all that they chose. Verse 3. And the Lord said. My spirit shall not always strive. With man. For that he also is flesh. Yet his way shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also, after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. 
and they bear them children to them. The sin became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Look at verse 5. And God saw, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The multitude, the majority of people on earth, the choices they made. And have you ever have you found out evil doers are always the majority at the time of Noah? This period that the Lord Almighty God was talking about, the majority of the people were those who have chosen the broad way, the wide gate. At the time of Lord Sodom and Gomorrah, the majority of people, they were the people that chose the wide gate and the broad way, multitudes of them. At the time of Elijah, multitudes chose the way of Baal, idol worship. They each chose the way of God. And at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, multitudes in the evil way. You see that after Jesus rose from the dead, even with all those ministries and miracles and everything that he did, he was only seen by about 500 and then on the day of Pentecost, uh, only 120 people were gathered. Not even up to 200. The multitudes of people, they had gone the broad way, the way of perdition, the way of destruction. And it's always like that. And it's still like that today. That many, they choose the broad entrance gate that leads into degeneration. Look at verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart verse 12 and god looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt for all the flesh all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth some 14 reading from verse 1 Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Think about that. God saw the lives of men, the hearts of men. The directions in which men and women, young and old, were moving and living. And it says they have done abominable works. And it says there is none that doeth good. None. Think about that. In verse 2. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any. That he did understand and see God. They are all gone aside, gone astray. They are all gone, all become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Which tells us then, as you look at the world in which we live, you find the majority of people, they are not following the way of the Lord. They do not even have the desire, the interest, the passion to want to choose the way of the Lord. It says, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and see God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Of all the workers of iniquity, no knowledge. Who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not 
upon the Lord. There they were in great fear, for God is not in the generation, and for God is in the generation of the righteous. Isaiah chapter 59, just describing to us that whether you're in Genesis, or then you move on to the time of the historical books of the Bible, or the time of the prophets, or you come to the Psalms, you find the same thing in the midst of men and women, in the lives they have lived before, and in the life they are still living today. Isaiah chapter 59. I'm reading from verse, 50, from verse 7 and verse 8. 59, verse 7. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste. To shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not. It's okay about the majority of people in the world in which we live. Millions and billions of people. That's why it will be wrong for you to follow the multitude. Because the multitude they are always wrong. At the time of Noah, the multitude, they were wrong. At the time of Abraham, the multitudes, they were wrong. At the time of Lot, in Sodom and Gomorrah, the multitudes were wrong. They are always wrong. At the time of the prophets, Jeremiah cried out, Elijah cried out to those people that went out of Baal. They are always wrong. The multitudes. At the time of Ezekiel or any of the other prophets, major or minor, you'll find the multitudes always go the way of evil. That's why if you're going to get to heaven, you, you make up your mind, you're going to join the minority of people. Only the minority walk in the light. Only the minority choose the right path. Only the minority choose the way of righteousness. Only the minority do the will of the Heavenly Father. And if you're going to get to heaven, you must make up your mind to be part of the few that find the way to life. Isaiah 59 verse 8. The way of peace they know not. And there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goes therein shall not know peace. And don't you find the majority of people in the world, they don't have any peace in their heart, any peace in their mind, any peace in their soul. The world peace they do not know. Look at verse 13. In transgression and lying against the Lord. And departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Verse 14 and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is falling in the street. Think about that. On your street, on every street on earth, truth is falling on the street. In the street, equity cannot enter. Ye truth faileth. And he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. That he is uh, departing from evil, living a righteous life, becomes so popular. That he who will separate himself and depart from evil makes himself a target of the multitudes of evil doers. Make himself, makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no judgment, there was no justice. And that's what you find at the uniform testimony in the Old Testament. And the New Testament is the same. The natures of men have not changed. 
attitudes of men have not changed. The character of men have not changed. Except for the few that come to Christ. Except for the few that come to Calvary. Except for the few that will turn away from their sin and have the blood of Jesus wash and cleanse them. The ways of men are still the same. Old Testament, New Testament, Old Era, New Era, Old Time and This Time. The same thing in Romans chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 28. Romans chapter 1. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Hey, you know that the people of the world, they think, you know, and they're going to put God to task. God will, is so interested in righteousness and holiness and truth and light and goodness and gospel. That if they are doing evil, God is going to stop every other thing that he has to do. And it's going to be arguing with them and putting pressure on them and pleading with them and begging them. It will not always happen that way. There are times God will abandon evil people to their evil deeds. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. He just said, there's no point. Ephraim is joined unto idols. Leave him alone. Let him alone. God give them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What are they? From verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. Isn't that where you find the majority of people on earth? Those are the people. They've gone in through the wide gate. Those are the people. They're walking in the broad way. And they live like the majority of people. Backbiters, haters of God. They're spiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things disobedient to parents go and find out today in which family don't you have children who are disobedient to parents in what institution can you get to that you'll not find people young people who are disobedient to constituted authority in what community will you get to that you'll not find people who are disobedient and rebellious? That's the way of the multitude. If you are like that, that's not strange. Graceless people do not have the heart, the strength, the grace, the ability to do right. In the way of the multitudes of people who are graceless. Who do not have the strength of the spirit in their lives. And it says that they are inventors of evil things. They are disobedient to parents without understanding. Covenant breakers. Without natural affection. Implacable. Unmerciful. The statue who knowing the judgment of God. That they which commit such things are worthy of death. That's the judgment, that's the damnation, the doom, the wrath of God, the indignation of God, the suffering, the sorrow, the torment that comes at the age of a life of evil. Knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. We look at First John chapter 5. Verse 19. First John chapter 5. Verse 19. We know that we are of God. That's just one part. Just one in the narrow way that leads to life eternal. 
But now look at the rest. And the whole world lies in the in wickedness. The whole world lies in wickedness. Well, we understand then, the white gate is a gate through which multitudes enter into, a li into life from the age of accountability. The white gate takes sin, everyone with loads of sin and evil without any restriction or restraint. There is ample liberty for everyone desiring to go through the white gate. The Pharisee and the Sadducees, you'll find them there. The hypocrite and the reprobate, you'll find them there. As going through the white gate and going through and walking in the white, in the broad way. The covetous and the deceiver, you find them on every street, in every community, on the broad way. Deceiving, and then doing some other things. They are the self-righteous and the religious. Church goers are there too, and also the fleshly, sensual, pleasure seekers. You find them in their nightclubs. Part of those who are on the Broadway, despisers of God and opposers of righteousness. Private and public sinners. Uh, those who do their own sins, commit their own sins in secret. And he used the cover of the night of secrecy to do their evil. They're still in the broad way. Other people, they're, they're not ashamed of, of their evil. They do their own publicly, unconverted moralists and unashamed criminals. The proud and the worldly, the vicious, violent men and the vile, vulnerable youths. You'll find all of them there. Wicked people and wandering backsliders, the tempters, the temptresses, and the victims all go through the wide gate that leads to the broad way of the world. At the end of it is destruction. I pray you will not be there. Give me a good amen. We come to point number two you now the broad evil way of multitudes leading to destruction. The broad evil way. Of multitudes leading to destruction. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. Matthew chapter 7. We're looking at verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. You notice that word straight doesn't have a GH in it. It's talking about something narrow, something small. You have to squeeze before you can get in through it. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate. And broad is the way. That leadeth to destruction. And many there be. Many there be. That go in there at. And you know as people come into life. And then you find a lot of people that have been born before you were born. They were living before you started living. And the majority of those people are evil people, sinful people, unrighteous people, wicked people, unclean people. The people that do not have the way of God, the mind of God, the word of God, and the will of God. And you know, it's, uh, you know, it's very easy to follow the evil way. Especially when multitudes are doing that evil thing. That's why as many people start growing in life. And they see the examples of multitudes of people doing evil. It becomes very easy for them as a path of least resistance to follow after those evil ways. That's why evil people keep on multiplying. And the evil deeds keep on multiplying too. Look at Psalm 36. I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 36. Reading from verse 1. The transgression of the wicked says within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. You see the multitude of the people in the world. That's what you'll find. 
And some of them are not even sure whether God is there or not. Some of them are not sure whether God knows them or not. Some of them are not sure whether God sees them or not. Some of them are not sure whether God minds what they do or not. Their thought is not the thoughts of God. Their actions are done independent of God. They follow their evil ways, not thinking about whether God is pleased or displeased. It says, a transgression of the wicked says, there is, there is no fear of God before his eyes. Verse 2, for he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. That's what you'll find almost virtually everywhere. The words of his mouth, iniquity and deceit. He has left off to be wise. He has left off to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. That tells us that the lifestyle of majority, the majority of people on earth, instead of resting at night, no, they will not. What will they do? They'll be imagining evil and planning evil, strategizing evil on their bed at night. And then when they wake up in the morning, that's exactly what they're going to do. Micah chapter 2. In Micah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 1. Woe to them that devise iniquity and walk evil upon their beds. Premeditated evil. Instead of resting at night, after such a busy day that they have done evil, they have been up and down, very active in evil. Instead of resting at night upon their beds, they're still thinking how they can perpetrate evil, increase evil, oppress people, how they can sin the more. But what to them that devise iniquity and walk evil upon their beds when the morning is light, they practice it because it's in the power of their hands. They covet fields. They cover the fields in the night while on their bed and take them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against the family do I devise an evil from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall ye go haughtily. For this time is evil. And so you find how men are. Don't they know what they're doing is evil? No, the majority of them don't know. Look at Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Their consciences are seared with a hot iron. Their hearts are hardened. Their eyes are blinded by the evil one. That they do not have any conviction at all, any awakening in their heart, in their soul, in their spirit, in their heart, that they're doing any evil. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but then the end thereof are the ways of death. In Isaiah chapter 13, the Lord assures us that even though they do not think, they do not know that they're doing evil, yet great will be the judgment of God against them. Isaiah chapter 13, and I'm reading there from verse 6. How are ye for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. 
Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travails. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord come is cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and it shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in its going forth, and the moon shall not cause a light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil. That's what the world is not thinking about. They don't have any calculation about that. They do not know that a reckoning day will come, a judgment day will come. But the Lord is saying, I will. And when God says, I will, nothing can stay his hand. Nothing can stop that plan or that purpose of God. I will punish the world for their evil. And the wicked and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogance, the pride of the proud to cease. And will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I pray when that judgment begins to fall, you will have sought refuge in Christ Jesus. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Because judgment does not come the very minute, the very moment a sinner commits sin. It's thinking because it didn't come today, it will not come ever. They don't understand. There's a time of sowing and there's a time of reaping. And it's not generally the day you sow that you reap, but the reaping time will definitely come. It reminds me of somebody who did not believe in God. And then he said, he said, God, if you are there, I don't accept you. I don't believe in you. And if you want to prove to me that you are there, knock me down. Knock me on the head so I will know you are there. God does not respond to the language of the demand of fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And then there was no hand that knocked him. He said, there you are. I told you there is no God. Wait. Reckoning day is coming. The reaping time will come. Today is just the day of sowing. How many people are now in, in the net of law enforcement agents and about to be judged? But the day they were doing what they did, it appeared there'll be, there'll be no judgment. They looked around after they have done what they have done and they say, where is judgment? Where is justice? Wait, it's coming. How many people today have HIV AIDS and they're dying because of an immoral life? And the first time they got into that immoral life, then it's like it's all pleasure. And then they say, but they said, but they said that if you do this, judgment will come. And they say, where is the judgment? Wait. It doesn't come that way. You have only sown. And the reaping time will come. And because sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily at that very moment, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Verse 12. 
though a sinner do evil an hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him, but it shall not be well with the wicked. Neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. We're looking at First Peter chapter 4. In First Peter chapter 4, it's just telling us that reckoning day will come, judgment day will come. That the judgment day has not come yesterday or has not come this morning, does not mean it will not come. Yes, it's coming. Sometimes it's look far away. Looks at you, looks at see, it will never come, but it will come. As long as there's a great God in heaven, a righteous God in heaven, whose eyes are purer than beholding iniquity, judgment day will come. And it's not very far away. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17, verse 18. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Why? Oh, because there are many people in the house of God who do not have Christ in their hearts, who do not take the, the word they hear in the house of God to heart. They hear about being born again. They are not born again. They hear about holiness and sanctification. Holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. They do not give their heart to it. They hear about repentance. They come to the house of God. They hear the word, the might, the will of God. But they do not give their hearts to it. That's why judgment will start in the house of God. They read it in the Bible. They mark it in their Bible. But they never set a time apart and say, Hey, today at this very time, I quit evil. I make a choice. Of the narrow gauge, the small gauge that leads into the narrow way. They never make up their minds. Because of that judgment will come. Will start at the house of God. Verse 17. For the time is come. That judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at them. At what? us and this peter and apostle us peter james john us paul timothy silas titus us everyone god is no respect of persons christ told nicodemus a ruler of the jews a ruler in the synagogue he must be born again Coming to church is not the end of the matter. Ye must be born again. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous castly be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? I pray that all of us will make up our minds and will follow the way of the Lord so that we will not be judged for the people of the world in Jesus' name. Jude verse 11. Jude verse 11. Warn to them. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for a word. And perished in the gainsaying saying of Cory. That's Korah of the Old Testament. Have you noticed something here? There are three people mentioned here. Number one, Cain. And do you know that Cain heard the voice of God? Do you know that God came to Cain and corrected him? And showed him there is sacrifice for sin. You can make an atonement. And you can get up and take that lamb and sacrifice. He had the voice of God. But he was lost. Just hearing is not enough. 
And then now it mentions Balaam. Again, Balaam heard the voice of God. Balaam, who are those people with you? Oh, they came to call me from Balak. What are they saying? They say I shall come and do this and that curse the children of Israel. You will not go. You must not go. And then those people came again. And God came to him and said, Balaam, who are these? Oh Lord, they have come back again. He had the voice of God. He saw a great miracle. As the ass saw the angel and then turned aside and Balaam beat the ass. And the ass began to speak with the voice of man. And Balaam heard an ass speaking in tongues. And then replied that ass and said, if I had a sword in my hand, I would have killed you. And the ass replied, why will you do that? Have I not been your ass? I've been riding all this time. Am I doing this every time? And then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. He saw an angel. What am I telling you? He still perished. Hearing the voice of God, that doesn't get you to heaven. It's good if you hear the voice. Seeing an angel, that doesn't get you to heaven. You must still make a choice. Make up your mind. Turn away from evil. And choose the way of life. Be born again. Hearing an ass speaking with the tongue of men. That doesn't get you to heaven. It's not just the miracle of speaking in tongues. Or the miracle of uh, replying those who speak in tongues. And uh, seeing the angel is the miracle of the new birth. Of a new heart. Of a new nature. If any man be in Christ... It's a new creature. All things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Without that change, without that transformation, heaven will be impossible. Now he talks about the third one, that's Corey. That's Korah. And you remember that Korah also was one of those notable, renowned men in the congregation of the children of Israel. These were, this is one of the elders, one of the leaders, and had actually heard the voice of God along with other elders too. And he had seen the miracle of passing through the Red Sea. And each in the miracle, the miracle, the miraculous provided manner. And drunk the water out of the rock. All the same. Drinking miracle water. Eating miracle food. Without keeping the new birth experience. Will not get anybody to heaven. That's why it says in Jude verse 11. One to them. They have gone in the way of Cain. And have run greedily after the heir of Balaam for a watch and perished in the gain saying of Corey. These are spots in your feast of charity. They feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wither is. Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the servant from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him these are murmurers you see that it doesn't take a great, great sins alone to get somebody into the way, into the broad way, even murmuring alone. That will do it. Complainers, complaining, that alone will do it. Walking after their own lusts. And their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration. 
That is, the respect, the rich, the wealthy, the great, the high, and those uh, popular people in the community. And for the sake of those rich, wealthy, popular people, they will do evil. They don't have any mind of their own. Any decision of their own. They have men's, admir men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Those are the people I pray God will deliver you from them. That you'll not be part of them in Jesus' name. The Broadway is deceptive. It seems right, proper and good to men of carnal reasoning. And since it's a, it's a road that is crowded with many rich, intelligent, worldly, wise, religious, church-going people going therein, there are many people that feel, can they all be wrong? And those pe people will think, this is a great multitude. And these are not just illiterate and, you know, unintelligent people. If these uh, people so intelligent and worldly wise, if they are there, what's wrong there? Because among these travelers, you'll find scientists, philosophers, successful businessmen. You'll even find preachers and, uh, preachers and priests, notable leaders among men, respected people in society. And so the average person will say, can this all be wrong? If they are on the broad way, are they not, are they not all right? They are deceived. The broad way is a downward road. It's easy, convenient, and it appears pleasant to travel on. It's the course of this world. It's the path of self-indulgence. It's the path of self-gratification. It's the path of self-interest. It's the path of self-will. Self-seeking, self-centeredness, and self-satisfaction. There is no edge, no control, no self-denial therein. It's easy, it's pleasant to the flesh. This broad way is not only downward, it's dangerous. It's a dangerous road. Unknown to the travelers, it leads to destruction, to eternal, irreversible destruction. We can only escape the damnation if we turn back from the broad way by repentance from sin and faith in Christ Jesus. That is total, true conversion to Christ before reaching the end of that way. Because after reaching the end of the way, there is no repentance or second chance after death. No one can be absolutely sure of being alive another day. That's why you must decide today. Enter through the narrow gate and walk in the narrow way that leads to life eternal. I pray God will give you the wisdom to make the right choice today. Let's look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, we're looking at verse 30. I have chosen the way of truth. It's a personal decision. It's a personal choice. I have chosen the way of truth. You will choose that way. Point number three now. The beta eternal wages of many doomed to damnation the bitter eternal wages of many doomed to damnation in Matthew chapter 7 we're reading from verse 13 Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 enter ye in at the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that which go in thereat. Here the Lord says, The end of those who choose the broad way, who go through the wide gate and live all their lives in the broad way, the way of sin, the way of evil, the way of self-will. The way of permissiveness. And those who walk in that way till the end of their lives. That it will be destruction. 
That just simply means hell, suffering. In Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Philippians 3, verse 18. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and I'll tell you even weeping. Here are people that the apostle was weeping for, but they were not weeping for themselves. They say, Paul, what's the matter with you? What's the sorrow? What's your heartache? What's your problem? What's the pressure upon your life? Why are you preaching and weeping? Who says I'm crying for you? Why are you crying for us? We don't even feel the danger, the doom, or the damnation. But somebody looking at him is, you know, feeling for him. It's like somebody who has drugged himself. And therefore, he has no feeling. And the house is in. The house is on fire. The house is burning. And because he has drugged himself, he's not having any feeling at all. He's insane. He's, you know, he's out of his mind. And he looks at all the flame around him. And he's, he thinks it's a game. It's a play. And the people outside who are looking at the burning house, knowing that the man is there, they're crying and screaming and weeping for him. But he is just enjoying himself. He's saying, what a wonderful thing is this. All these colorful things. He doesn't know this. called flame, fire around me here. Looks very colorful. Doesn't have any sense of the pain. Instead of crying and screaming. Wanting to have a way out. He's rejoicing in destruction and damnation. And that's like the people here. Paul the apostle crying for them. But they're not crying for themselves. And they think that getting to hell is a game. For many walk of whom I have told you often. Now and now tell you even weeping. That they are the enemies of the cross. Whose end is destruction. Whose God is their belly. Whose glory is in their shame. Who mind as least things. And yet, the perdition is so near, but you will escape. I said you will escape. In First Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. For they that will be rich, they that will be rich, look up for a moment, as you look at our society today, any society in the world, what do you find? What do you find? The majority of people, they that will be rich, they are passionate about money, about wealth, about riches, about prosperity. They that will be rich. And they don't care what they do. They don't care who they trample upon. They don't care what law of God they trample on their feet. They don't care even if they lose their lives in the beach to have the money. Money controls them, controls their waking thoughts, their mind, their desires. The places they go, the places they don't go. Everything is money, money, money. That's the heart of the majority of people in the world today. And if you are not running their rat race with them, they are wondering what kind of man are you? What kind of woman are you? Are you not a human being? Everybody is running. Get up and run. They run the evil way. That's their mind. And think about parents today. And the parents are so eager. The money we, did, we didn't have as, you know, young people. Our children must have the money. Where we didn't get to, our children must get there. The children are running. The parents are encouraging them to run. And the parents are running themselves. And everybody is running the wrong direction. And their mind is just to be rich. And it's a way of destruction. the way of perdition. Because I've seen that money, it makes a lot of people to do evil. And you're never satisfied. 
Oh, you see, when I have a hundred thousand in the bank, I'm going to just relax. Just this one hundred thousand, just, just just this first beach. And then you'll not even eat, you'll not take care of yourself, take care of anybody. And then when you get a hundred thousand in the bank, then you say, Oh, that looks I thought it would be very far away. Okay, when I get the next 100,000, I think I'll be all right. I think I should be all right. And then it, it goes on and on like that. You keep on lifting the bar and lifting the height and lifting the expectation. Eventually it becomes 900,000. Ah, you say I'll soon become a millionaire. Once I become a millionaire and I can have a million there in the bank, I'm through, I'm through. Then I can now face other things. And then you have a million naira now, or million dollars, or million whatever, inside in the bank. You say, what is it? Now I become a millionaire. And to keep being a millionaire, I need to make up effort. Because now that I've joined the kind of, you know, the team, the group of people that are called millionaires, I don't want to come back again and that thing will not decrease it must increase and you never stop until you just die like this you die in the midst of money you go into mystery misery eternal unending torture come back seek the lord find the way of the lord because it says they that will be rich fall into temptation and snare and into many foolish and awful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Look up here, brothers and sisters. You know, if you don't love something above God, you'll never do evil. Think about it in your life. If you're just, you're just neutral, money, women, men, fame, popularity, any interest, just debt to them. I'm not interested. If you don't have any interest in anything above God, you'll never do evil. Check up. Anytime you do something wrong, you have an intention, you have a goal, you have a desire, you have something you are passionate about. You have something that your heart wants to grab. And there is somebody in your way hindering you from getting that thing. And you want to, you want to deal with him. If you don't have anything you want, anything you desire, anything you're passionate about, that so and so is standing in the way, you're not going to do evil to anybody. That's why people do evil. You're standing in their way. You're not allowing them to get at the wealth, at the money, at the fame, at the property, at the whatever it is they're seeking after because you're not allowing them. You're standing in their way. I want to be that thing. I want to do that thing. I want to get there. This man, this woman is standing in my way. That's why you do evil. For the love of money. The love of riches, the love of fame, the love of selfish interest, the love of something that is beside God is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. By the way, by the way, look up here. Anytime somebody tries to do evil to you, just, just sit back and reason is looking for something. And he thinks I'm standing in his way. Just, just get out of the way. Whatever he wants to have, let him have. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? You want to have it? Just, just clear out of the way for them. They leave you alone. Until they, except they think that maybe you just did that temporarily. You're still coming back. You're going to stand in their way. They'll be putting whatever it is. They do evil because they think that you're standing in their way. That's why they do evil. You won't allow them to have that thing their mind is centered on. I don't fight with anybody on some of these things in the world. Riches and 
gold and wealth and inheritance and whatever it is, what shall it profit them or profit you or profit me? If we gain the whole world and then we lose our soul, what shall it profit us? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the face. And they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, O woman of God, any man of God here tonight? I said any woman of God here tonight? Where are you? Thank you, God bless you. And you know what the Lord is telling us? He's saying, set your eyes on the final goal. Man of God, woman of God, flee these things. Now, all those people that were seeking after those things, where are they today? It's just a matter of time. Look at Herod. He heard that Jesus Christ was born. And he's the king of the Jews. Ah, another king. His mind was on being a king. Go and look for him. Come and show me where he is. He wanted to kill Jesus so that there will be no king. His heart was just on that. I must be the king. The only one that is known. That's why people do evil. If G How many people had been born? If Jesus had been born and nobody said he was king, rivaling him, competing with him, he wouldn't do what he did. It's because of what he wanted. That's why he went on rampage, killing all those children. But where is Herod today? All those evil doers, where are they today? That's why it says, so man of God, oh woman of God, oh child of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness. You're, not, you're going to have competition there. If you're running after money, there's going to be competition. If you're running after position, there's going to be competition. If you're running after personal interest, there's going to be competition. There is a, an area of life where there's no competition. Nobody is going to compete with you. They are not interested in righteousness. If you go into their area and you're looking for the money they're looking for, there's competition there. If you're looking for the property that they're looking for, there's competition there. And they will fight you with diabolical weapons to might lose your life before your time. But here is where there's no competition. Righteousness, follow after righteousness. Godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. In your place of work... You know, once I, those people know that you're in competition with them, they're looking for the promotion, you're looking for promotion. You're looking, they're looking for the favor of the director. You are looking for the favor of the director. There's competition. But when you leave everything in the hands of God, whatever I have, I have. Whatever I don't have, I don't have. And it doesn't matter. And then you, you come into the race where there's no competition. Nobody is going to compete with you. Running after righteousness and faith and godliness and love and patience and meekness. Fighting the good fight of faith. By the way, you're not fighting anybody. You're fighting yourself. Your flesh wants to hinder you. Beat it down. Pride wants to come into your heart. You beat it. It's a personal internal fight. You have, you know, left the other fight as the bad fight of unbelief. And fighting other people. But now you say, no, he is not my, I don't have anything to do with him or to do with her. I'm not in competition with her. I'm not in competition with him. I'm not trying to get Naboth's vineyard from him. I'm not trying to get the title of Jezebel from her. We have nothing in common. I'm not seeking anything. All I'm seeking for is that this sin inside me will not hinder me from getting to the kingdom of God. And therefore, I fight that internal battle. And I put my body, I don't put their body under. I don't put anybody under. So I'm not looking for slaves. I'm not looking for servants. I'm not looking for their money. I'm not looking for their job. I'm looking for just myself to get to the kingdom of God. And therefore, you fight the good fight of faith. Sin wants to get in. Immorality wants to get in. 
And then pride wants to come in. You say, no, I'm fighting that. And then somebody says, can you join me? This man is my enemy. Let us for yourself. I have a greater fight. I'm fighting inside here. There's something inside me here that will not allow me to get to the kingdom of God. And I want to fight it to finish. That other fight, now I'm not interested in that one. Fight! The good fight of faith. And then it says, lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art so called. And as, and as a profess a good profession before many witnesses. You know, if we fight like that with the weapons of warfare that are not carnal, by the grace of God, we are going to win the race. Hell is a place of eternal punishment. That's the final destination of all those who walk on the broad way that leads to, until the end of their lives. The fallible word of God describes the final destiny of multitudes of broad, of, of, on the broad way as number one, the lake of fire and brimstone. I pray you'll not be there. Number two, as devouring fire and everlasting burnings. Number three, as a furnace of fire. Number four, as a place of torments. Number five, as a place of everlasting punishment. Number six, as a place of blackness, of darkness forever. And number seven, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of tears. But I'm not going to go there. I said I'm not going to go there. What are you going to do then? Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, we're looking at verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. That's what the Lord is telling us. You've seen the broad way. You've seen the wide gate. You've seen the destination, the destiny of the people that follow after that evil way. And he's saying he wants you to get to heaven. He wants you to get to that happy life at the end of your journey here on earth. And he says just one thing you have to do to be able to get there. Enter ye in at the straight gate. In very plain language, be born again and remain righteous and holy until the end of time. Rise, rise up and let us talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord will help you. Help you in particular. Help you in particular. That whatever will hinder you from getting to that heaven, that God will help you to overcome. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord... Have mercy on me. Look at your life. Look at your choices. Look at the way you are walking. Look at your interest. Look at your passion. Look at your desires. Look at your goal. Look at what your center, your focus on. And the Lord is saying, enter ye in at the straight gate. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Call upon the Lord. The gate is open. God loves you. He doesn't want you to perish. He doesn't want you to end up in destruction, in perdition. That's why he's saying, Enter in. You don't want to come to church in vain. You don't want to read the Bible in vain. You don't want to hear the voice of the Spirit in vain. See all the great things the Lord is revealing to us because of His love for us. And because He does not want us to perish with the multitude. On the broad way that leads to destruction and perdition. See the call of the Lord. Enter ye in at a straight gate. For wide is the gate. And broad is the way. That leadeth unto destruction. Unto damnation. Unto perdition. Unto eternal suffering. And many. There be. That go in. There are. 
many, many of your neighbors, many of your friends, many of the people around you, they are thoughtless. They think life will continue forever. They think they always remain young. They don't understand. Life is fleeting, flying by. And they live from day to day in the broad way that leads to destruction. You don't want to follow those thoughtless people who are not thinking of where they will spend eternity. Go to church without knowing the meaning of going to church. You don't want to follow such people who read the Bible without knowing the purpose of having the Bible to read. The wise five wise virgins five foolish virgins make up your mind make your choice the choice you make today can determine your eternal destiny you turn away from sin you turn to jesus christ as the only savior he forgives he saves he transforms and changes our lives makes us to hate the evil things of the past and to love the word of God, the will of God should love to do it. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Make this moment the moment of decision. To enter in through the straight gate. And to receive grace from the Lord. To walk in the narrow path that leads unto life eternal. Tell the Lord to reveal your mind to you, your heart to you. Is there anything you love above God? Anything you love above the will of God, above the word of God? Anything you are bent on having? That will push you to do something contrary to the teaching of the word of God? Tell the Lord to reveal yourself to you. That the Lord will help you to have real definite assurance of belonging to the Lord. For the time has come. The judgment must begin at the house of God. And it will first begin at us. What will the end of them be? That will be not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Multitudes around you, they do evil. Without grace, 
you'll not be able to swim against the tide of evil. It takes the grace of God. Definite experience, relationship, fellowship of the Lord. That's what it takes for you to be able to live a life of righteousness. Leave the things of the world to the people of the world. Don't compete with them. Come over to this side. And follow after righteousness. There's no competition there. After faith. Love. Patience. Godliness. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call your pony while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man is thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord. Then the promise is the Lord will abundantly pardon. Today, make your choice. And then be able to testify with the psalmist. I have chosen the way of truth. Pray until there's definite assurance in your heart that your sins are forgiven. Until the Spirit of God bears witness in your heart. Now grace is available. For you to live a life to the glory of God. Remember what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What will you give in exchange for your soul?